Evil is real. That is the theme that we deal with here on the Playing With Fire podcast. And I have to tell you, I'm really excited for season two. We are now in season two of the show. We are dropping these episodes right after Easter. And there is a reason for that. Jesus' death on the cross, overcoming death, overcoming evil, setting in course an amazing transformational grace for all of humanity. That is what we are doing here. It may seem strange, we're talking about issues of evil, we're talking about the enemy, we're looking for evidence through people's stories of what we see in scripture, that there is a battle between good and evil. That is what this show is all about, exposing that discussion, talking about evil, but only in a sense that it brings us toward truth, toward healing, and toward hope. Season one, there was a collection of amazing stories, stories from people who had gone through all sorts of different spiritual warfare. And today, we're gonna be talking with Kyle Winkler. He is the author of the new book, Shut Up Devil, Silencing the 10 Lies Behind Every Battle You Face. Now, Kyle has a really interesting ministry, and he has a perspective. I mean, that's why we're having him here, a perspective that can help all of us deal with the lies that we're told. Now, after Kyle's episode, we're going to be getting into some gritty, tough stories, and that's going to come next week. But this week, we're going to focus on who is the enemy, why does he lie, and how can we stand up against those lies? With no further ado... Let's welcome Kyle to the podcast. Kyle, thanks for joining me today. How's it going? It is great, Billy. I appreciate being back with you. Thanks so much. Well, it's exciting to be back because you and I met years ago when you released your app and now you've got the book, Shut Up Devil. And I want to make sure I I wanna make sure I've got your I've got your subtitle, Silencing the Ten Lies Behind Every Battle You Face. And I love that subtitle on this book. But but Shut Up Devil, that's been something that's been sort of a brand name that's been with you because you created the app and it's one of those things that catches your attention talk to us a little bit about why you chose that particular title yeah well billy i think you were actually the very first person to interview me for an article that you wrote on shut up devil so you kind of are at the birth with the launch of all this so i i owe a lot of thanks to you for that (laughs) Yeah, but, it was a fun interview. That must have been eight years. I don't know, 10 years. It I, had I to be why. probably seven years ago, yeah, I think. It was yeah. 2014 time frame or so. And it just really God breathed on it. And there's been more than a quarter million downloads and uh, wow. things on it. So I just praise God for his favor on that. But originally it was a tool that I created for me. And just a lot of the story that I go through in my book and that I'm very open with with sharing and have been for years is just a lot of the insecurities and mind games that I've battled well after I was a Christian, in some ways more after I was a Christian than before I was a Christian. But I would take scriptures related to the things that I was facing to confront the mind games and the lies with truth. And so I've got a web and technology background. So my mind started to just think about, man, this would be a great thing for an app. And I thought, what would I name this app? Well, what does scripture do to the lies? What does scripture or truth do to the devil? It shuts him up, just like Jesus did in the wilderness. You know, when the enemy came after him, questioning him, he used the truth of God's word to say, shut up, devil. So that's really where it came from. I created it. Yeah, (laughs) it it says what it does. So like I I said, God, God really just breathed on it and it gets people's attention. And so now... Seven years later, we finally had the opportunity to really expound upon what it means to shut up the devil and actually take all of the issues that are in the Shut Up Devil app, because it's got 27 issues or so in there that everybody faces and it it confronts those issues with truth. I took the lies behind those issues, the 10 common lies behind those issues, and expounded upon them in the book Shut Up Devil. So I want to get I want to get into the book, but before I do, I have to ask you this. You and I have talked about this topic a lot over the years, and it really feels like because we're so materialistic, because we're living in this world where it's all about the here and now, this conversation about Satan as a real entity, as scripture tells us he is, who has power, 
who can have an impact on people's lives and who does have an impact on people's lives, it seems to almost go out the window. There are a lot of people who don't want to talk about it, who don't acknowledge it, not just in the world, but in the church as well. And so I want to just throw that to you. I mean, what do you think drives that that apathy toward understanding the impact that Satan can have? Yeah, such a great point, because in some ways, I think the world gets it more than some people in the church. I mean, I've gotten more flack, I think, from some people in the church over titles related to the devil. Why are you always talking about the devil so much? And as I even open up the book with is, I don't want to obsess about the devil. This isn't obsessing about the enemy, but the Bible does talk a lot about him. And definitely one of the key scriptures that I reference is 1 Peter 5, 8, where it says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around. So I think obviously it's one of the great deceptions if the enemy can convince people that he doesn't exist at all. And that is where sadly a lot of people in the church culture are today. And I think it it has to do with everybody wants a positive message. We're definitely, and I preach a positive message and I want a positive message as, as, as much as the next person does. But I think we're so afraid that we might turn somebody off by negativity or we might spark paranoia or whatever that we just throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I tell people the most positive message isn't the denial of evil, it's the defeat of evil. And that's ultimately what I'm going through in this book is the devil is a sneaky but defeated foe. We don't need to obsess about him, but talking about him isn't negative. It can actually be very positive and actually be very helpful for people. Well, that's what's so amazing about the book, Shut Up Devil, is that you are giving people tools and helping them understand how to how to deal with this. I think, you know, I look at when I was working on my book, Playing With Fire, which you, you know, you had me on to talk about and we yeah, I've had a great, great conversation about it. I had a lot of people coming at me. Why would you write this? Why are you giving Satan attention? Similar to what you right. just said. And it was remarkable to me because I'm watching every September and October Hollywood churn out movie after movie after movie <laughs> about possession and demons. And of course, they're not doing it in a theologically correct way, right. but they're doing it. They're actually talking about this church topic more than some people in the church are. And I love your point about not obsessing over it because that's really important. There is a facet of of people in the church who, who do obsess over it. They see a demon under every rock. Everything is caused by demons. Every bad decision that you made, you know, somehow is a demon's fault. That's not good. But but really the bigger issue I've been concerned with is that other side, the people who are not talking about Ephesians 6, that we're in the middle of this battle. And so I love that you come out with this book. You're addressing this you are speaking to it. Um, Talk a little bit about how you chose the different ways to silence the devil, how you distilled those in this book. Yeah, so so much of how I teach and what I talk about through my messages and certainly throughout the book goes back to my own story. I remember I was a serious Christian for 10 years or so, and when I mean serious Christian, I was employed in a huge church. I got to be in leadership in another ministry. I graduated with my master's of divinity and biblical studies. And so I, I was like, I mean, I was in (laughs) and there I was though, 10 years into all of this complaining to God that I still am feeling and still am dealing and still have a lot of the same fear and anxiety and depression and shame and mind games that I did before I was a Christian. As I told you earlier, in some ways, even more after becoming a Christian which that, is crazy, right? I mean, that's which crazy, is, but, but it's yeah, common. It, yeah. I hear from so many people that have the same story. And so I said, God, what more do I need to do? <laughs> I was doing all kinds of things. I mean, every deliverance curriculum, and I was fasting for seven days and all these prayer strategies, which don't get me wrong, all of those things have their place. But God showed me that wasn't the solution for me. He actually took me all the way back to potty training in certain ways to show me these series of lies that I had picked up from before I can remember, lies that I had picked up when life let me down, lies that I had taken as truth. Just things like, even when I was in childhood, like, you don't belong. You're just an outcast. Nobody's ever going to love you. God is punishing you. All of those things that I was trying to, I think, especially after I became a Christian, I was trying to work 
my way to achieve God's acceptance and God's love and things like that. And that was just the cycle of up and ups and downs. That's what really created the mind games more than anything, because it was like, okay, I've done all this, but yet I still don't feel like he loves me. I've tried and I've tried. And it's just this, this roller coaster of emotions that I know a lot of people can relate with. So God said, it's not about doing more, Kyle. As a matter of fact, all you're doing is creating the issues. It's really about reprogramming your mind from all of those patterns of thinking that the lies created in you and learning how to properly reprogram or renew your mind according to truth. So after that worked for me and I started to apply it to other people's life through ministry, I realized this is a method, so to speak, that really needs to be explained through a book. So that's what I did. Do you think, I mean, do people need to fear the devil? This is the, and it's it's kind of a loaded question for a, a lot of reasons, because I said people, and by people, I mean people in general, and then Christians. Let's talk about those two categories of people. Um, do people need to fear Satan? No, I don't think in general, that people need to fear Satan. Now, certainly Satan has a different role to the point that you made there on an unbeliever versus a believer. So on an unbeliever, he does have a level of power that sure is scary because his evidence that he brings up, his accusations, if you will, of what you did do, those things do have power because those things do, as an unbeliever, actually separate you from God. But As a believer, the enemy's evidence, the enemy's accusations, first chapter of Shut Up Devil, I talk about how his name actually means slanderer. So that's what he does to a believer. He tries to slander you. Well, though those things that he brings up might be real, maybe real things that you did do or was said about you or that you do feel, they have no merit to a believer because God says that a believer is in Christ. And so as Someone who is in Christ, you are made new, you are made right, you are made whole, you are made holy because of the blood of Jesus. So because of that reason, a believer really doesn't need to fear the enemy, even though, sure, some of what he says can be scary, but it really has no merit. It can't really do anything to you except maybe to convince you of lies, which is kind of what I talk about in the book. That's really the enemy's only power. And that's why I also call it shut up, devil. It's not about engaging in an argument with the enemy because that's giving him more place in your life than he deserves to have as a believer. It's not about arguing with the enemy. It's actually about dismissing him. When you tell someone to shut up, which I don't recommend doing, you're actually (laughs) saying you're not worthy of my attention. Go away. But you can say that to the devil, and that's what this is all about. It's really saying, no, you've been defeated in my life because of Christ. I am in Christ, so therefore you don't have a place to talk to me. So shut up devil. It's authority. It's it's an issue of authority there. And, you know, you mentioned a word before deliverance, which when you were talking, you know, about your experience and you talked about prayer and deliverance, a lot of people, I found the conversation around deliverance to be really fascinating because people have a lot of different views, a lot of different perspectives on what it is, how it should be exercised, who needs it. I was just going to throw it. I'm just kind of curious if you would speak to that a little bit on that issue in case people were curious when they heard that word. Right. So so my position, again, this is this is speaking largely to Christians here. The moment that you say yes to Jesus, you are then put in Christ. And so God is then your authority. So I'm not somebody that believes that a true, genuine, authentic, whatever other word you want to use for real Christian can be possessed. I think you are possessed by the Holy Spirit. And that is it. And I remember when we spoke about yeah. your book. That's ultimately generally the conclusion that yeah. you came yeah, to. Yep. Right, yep. right. And so, so I think that all the enemies can have access into your life through as a believer is really your mind. Colossians 2.15 says that he's disarmed. The cross disarmed him. It took away his power. And so That doesn't mean that he's banished. It doesn't mean that he no longer exists. It just means that his power to actually separate you from God because of sin and shame and everything else really no longer exists. So the only way that he can really access, in in my opinion, the only way he can access a Christian is through the mind. And that's really where we 
kind of give him any power or authority is letting him in here lie to us. And that's kind of the opening then. And that's, as I explore through the book, as he gets access to your mind through lies, therein lies the emotional and psychological and really a lot of the spiritual battles that we have. It really all starts up here. Yeah. Our experiences, the things we've gone through, you know, and that's why it's so important to understand people as, you know, complex, right? We've got our physical, we've got the emotional and the mental, and we've got the spiritual and those things, there are different components. And I know other people will define them differently, but the point is we're multifaceted. And, and in that, if you're ignoring one part of it, the world ignores the spiritual part, right? And some people, sometimes the church ignores some of the the mental pieces of the puzzle, right? That's been a conversation we've been having in the church the last five years, especially. Um, But, but it is interesting because there are people in this world who will say in the, in the faith world, well, everybody needs a deliverance. Every Christian needs to go through a deliverance, right? That's a very common thing. And, and it always struck me as interesting because even interviewing people dealing with the more extreme issues, right, of possession or, you know, however, again, there's a whole slew of words we can use to describe all these things, but we'll go with possession. Yeah. That when you're when you're dealing with that sort of thing, that they have had some pastors, I know they walk into a room, they say, shut up, devil, get out, you're not welcome here, and the issue is solved. And you, then you hear of these other circumstances where people are doing 12 different things to try to make that happen. Now, complex issue. I don't even want to go down that rabbit hole, but I do think it's <laughs> oh, There's bad. so it's much bad. we could say on that. There yeah. is. I mean, there is. Because, <laughs> I mean, look, and you Jesus, say a lot of it in your book as well, which I appreciated. Exactly. So so getting, getting back to your book, Shut Up, Devil, and for anybody who's just popping on and, and watching or listening right now, we are talking about the book Shut Up, Devil. You deal with these lies. Now, I don't want you obviously ruining the book and unveiling all the lies right now, but but what would you say of the lies, if you could share one with us or some insight on one that really resonated with you personally the most? Yeah, so probably the the first lie that I begin with in the book, I, I started it as the first lie because it is foundational. It's probably the most toxic lie that the enemy tells Christians. And it's the one that caused me a whole lot of shame for sure and insecurity. And it's the lie that you are still a horrible sinner. And it's so deceptive because it almost sounds holy. I mean, I thought when I thought that years gone by, you know, after I would maybe fail to something or fall or make a mistake or sin or struggle or whatever, I would think these thoughts that, oh, I'm just still a a horrible sinner. And I almost thought it was God telling me that. But all it did was actually partner me with the enemy's defeat. And as I go through each lie in the book, and this is really the process of deliverance, kind of going back to to your point in the last question, is for me, I don't consider myself a deliverance minister in the sense that a lot of people would call deliverance ministry as an exorcism and things like that. I believe that deliverance really is a process of deprogramming your mind from the enemy's lies. So in that sense, this book is a book of deliverance because I take you through systematic truth really with every chapter to to deprogram your mind from that lie and then reprogram it with truth. So that lie that you are still a horrible sinner, the reason I can say that's a lie lies at the very heart of the gospel. And it lies at a misunderstanding that a lot of people have of what salvation is. A lot of people think it's kind of just this event that covered their sin and maybe cleansed them, but that there's still this sin that's underlying that might rear its ugly head from time to time that they have to just work so hard to keep covered. When the truth of the matter is the moment that you said yes to Jesus, you went through what's called a regeneration in theological speak. That's old turning into new. I like that word regeneration, and I talk a lot about it in that chapter because the first six letters of that word spell regene. And that's actually what happens the moment that you are saved. You aren't just covered, but you are actually regened. The Bible says that your sin nature was cut away. That's your old identity of sin. It was actually cut away, and therefore you were then regened with the identity of Christ. That's what made you a completely new person. And so that identity isn't something that can just be removed, or it's not something that can just be taken away from you. I like how Paul likens it to 
in, in Ephesians 6, when he goes through the armor of God, he likens righteousness to a breastplate. And I go through a whole thing about what that breastplate looked like, but just in short, that breastplate of righteousness and why righteousness is like a breastplate is, is because that is the one tool in the Roman soldier's armor that couldn't fall off. It couldn't be cut off. It couldn't be taken off. It was actually fastened to them. And that's how it is with our righteousness in Christ, with our new identity in Christ. It's not something that you can stumble and trip and fall and lose. It's not something somebody can take away from you, but it's something that you have that no person, no past, no body, no battle, no sin, no struggle can remove from you. So understanding for me that, yeah, even though I might have wrong memories at time or even wrong feelings at time, Christ writes me despite me. I'm not a horrible sinner anymore as a Christian, but I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm his child and I'm loved unconditionally. I love that. No, that is so, That's and that's the message, right? I think so many people yeah. right now are living in confusion and this is becoming a bigger issue as culture is getting more chaotic because people are getting swept up into more of this confusion, right? And whenever we right. see confusion, we know where it's coming from. We understand where it's coming from. Um, but that, you know, understanding that is great. Uh, but there are people who are trapped in it that we need to be able to reach. And also, I think that the damage that is done in in the church not talking about this topic, when certain churches don't talk about it, is that you don't equip people to prepare for any of this, to prepare for battle or to wage the battles in their mind that we're talking about here and to fight back. And so that is what you are doing here. Where can people go to grab copies? If people want to grab this book again, it's shut up devil silencing the 10 lies behind every battle you face. Right. So it's available wherever books are sold and it's in paperback ebook. It's audio book. If, if you like to listen, it can also be uh, purchased on my website at Kyle Winkler dot org as well but go to your favorite bookstore just type in shut up devil it rolls off the fingers really nicely and you'll find it there awesome thank you so much we'll have to have you back again real soon i'd love it billy thank you it's been a pleasure that brings us to the end of this episode of the playing with fire podcast make sure you head over to the edify app it's the e-d-i-f-i app on your iphone on your Android, on your tablet, whatever device you're using, download the Edify app today. You can also head over to edify, E-D-I-F-I dot app in your web browser to listen. There are thousands of Christian podcasts you can stream and listen to right now. Head over to Edify and be sure to tune in next week because we are going to be talking with a really, really amazing person. I'm going to tell you this. It is an incredible conversion story from witchcraft into faith. We will be talking with a former witch who found Jesus. Fascinating story. Tune in next week. I'll see you then.